to live Christian lives. That's the title of our sermon series. We're at part three of nine. The subtitle is Celebrating and Strengthening the Every Generation Purpose of Our Church. And the title for today is Be the Church. It's from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. We're working through the whole book of 1 Peter as our series. And so here we are. We're at chapter 2 now, verses 1 through 10. The Word of God. Starting in chapter 2, verse 1, 1 Peter. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. May God add his richest blessing to this, the reading of his word. Amen? Let me pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for scripture. Thank you for these verses. Help us to understand what we're reading, what we're studying. Give us the character to apply the meaning to how we live, that we may bring you glory through how we live. In your name, Jesus, we pray, and all of God's people said, amen. So we sat around in a circle, a bunch of us pastors. We meet a couple times a year. This was kind of our big annual meeting. It's not big, it's just a handful of us. But there we are. There we were. And one is chosen each year to lead the reflection time, to offer a devotional. And so this year, the pastor leading that devotion posed a question. And his whole devotion was just around this question, what do you want or what do you long for? And a bunch of us had a litany of complaints about our jobs and our lives because we are burnt out, worn out, emptied out, dried up, weary pastors. And there we were. And this other pastor is leading us. And, you know, at first, none of us were that impressed with the question, what do I want? Give me a break. It's pretty obvious what I want. It's pretty obvious I'm not getting it, right? But he pressed us. He didn't let up. What do you want? What do you want? What do you long for? And one by one, we realized that we didn't know what we wanted. Then we realized that it wasn't the difficulty of our vocation that was depleting our energy, deleting our joy. No, it was the fact that we didn't know what we wanted. More precisely, we were saying that we wanted one thing, but living and acting and reacting like we wanted something else. And it turns out that, at least according to the Bible, that all you need to do, and it's really not something you do, but all you need to do in order to live a Christian life is to want to live a Christian life. Yet that's where so many of us fall short, maybe all of us from time to time. We don't want or long for a Christian life, at least 
That's the story that our choices are telling sometimes. We don't want or long for the real thing. We want something less. And for some of us, that's the reason why we lack the full blessing and power, the beauty, the presence of God in our lives. We don't want it. Could this be true, that we don't want it? That seems like it is sometimes. We say we long for him, but we act like we don't. We act like we do want less. Less is easier, we think. Less is what we know. I call it the mac and cheese principle. That's a family term. That's my particular term for it, and I'll explain. Our kids, for a time, and their kids, daughters particularly, they like a certain food until they don't, and it just changes just instantly, and you just can't keep up, and you can kind of never buy the right food because they like this for a month, but now I hate that. I, I, yeah, it's gross. I don't want that. But from time, you know, for, for a certain time, from time to time, they've liked macaroni and cheese and of course what they got most of the time was the pre-packaged kind the kind you find in boxes even a healthy version of a box of macaroni and cheese is less than the real thing the noodles are real i guess but the cheese is like in a packet this kind of orange powder that you, you, you mix and you stir until the chemicals in it initiate a congealing process so that the cheese-like liquid colors and then sticks to the noodles. It's not real cheese. It's macaroni and something like cheese. You know? And the kids liked it. So I was excited when we went to kind of a semi-fancy restaurant and as part of the kids' menu, it was macaroni and cheese, but it was the real thing. I was like, oh, yeah, I got to get this. You are going to like this. In fact, you'll have this and you'll never go back. You know, to the kind you get from the box, because it's the real thing. It's what the box is trying for, you know? This is it. So we order this. I'm excited about it. It's kind of the ultimate comfort food. I mean, there it was. And, and they tried it, and they hated it. <laughs> Yuck. Ew. Gross. Seriously, we were shocked. But then we realized that they had developed a taste for the boxed mac and cheese. They were used to it. They were so used to it that they didn't want the real thing. Now, is that you? Is that me? Is that us when it comes to the Christian life? What do we want? What do we long for? Do we long for the real thing? Our text today defines the church. It is often quoted. But sometimes the point of the whole passage is missed. How do we come to be the amazing church described in these amazing and inspiring verses? It is about identity, but not just our individual identity or what we each individually want or long for. It's about our identity as an organization, as a community. Some like to say family, which is okay, can be nice, except that that can lead to some unhealthy places, dysfunctional places, which is likely why that term family is never used to describe the church in Scripture, but rather family, not, not family, the body of Christ, or uh, what you see here, the people, the people of God. And what you see in Scripture is nearly all the families that we get enough information about are profoundly dysfunctional. And then God will redeem that dysfunction and that family, redeem that whole thing and create out of that a community of grace called the people of God here in 1 Peter chapter 2. So what is that grace that we're a community of? Well, that's what's described in chapter 1. We've looked at that. We've seen what it means. And we've seen what our response to it is to be holiness. We've seen that. Now, where does that bring us? If we are the people of God, then how do we treat one another? And what do we long for? What do we want? All covered in these first couple of verses. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. So to start out, malice, deceit, 
Hypocrisy, envy, slander, they're out. Let's look at each one. I found online definitions for each one. Let's just be clear about what is not indicative of the people of God. What God does not want. What is a sign that we are not who he's called us to be. Malice, a definition. A desire to harm others or to see others suffer. Extreme ill will or spite. The intent to commit an unlawful act without justification or excuse. An improper motive for an action such as desire to cause injury to another. Have you seen this in the world? Have you seen it in the church? Most of us would probably say, yeah, both a little bit. But for the church or the people of God, if we're going to be the real thing, we can't have it. We can't have this. No malice. Deceit, a definition, the act or practice of deceiving, deception, a stratagem, a trick, the quality of being deceitful, falseness. Well, this is also in the church as well as in the world, and it ought not be, right? But the challenge is that sometimes this kind of falseness, this seen as a virtue. Oh, it's good to have a stratagem to be tricky. And you got people claiming to be Christians. Maybe they are. But they seem to have an affection for this, and it ought not be. Scripture says no. No to malice, no to deceit, hypocrisy. We're often accused of that as Christians. Anyone making a stand of any kind is often accused of that. Here's the definition that I found. The practice of professing beliefs, feelings, or virtues that one does not hold or possess falseness, an act or instance of such falseness, the act or practice of a hypocrite, a feigning to be what one is not or to feel what one does not feel, a dissimulation or a concealment of one's real character, disposition, or motives, especially the assuming of false appearance of virtue or religion, a simulation of goodness. Do we want our Christianity to be like the mac and cheese in a box, kind of a simulation. The thing is, the mac and cheese in a box is pretty good sometimes. But the simulated Christianity, that's never good. That's always worthless, a simulated Christian life. Hypocrisy, out, envy, a feeling of discontent or resentment, Aroused by and in conjunction with desire for the possession or qualities of another, the object of su such feeling. And they give an example here. Their new pool made them the envy of their neighbors. Malevolence. So envy is synonymous with coveting, and there it is in the 10th commandment, thou shalt not covet. And that's the commandment you break to break all the other ones. That's how you sin. That's how sin works. That's how sin starts. That's the key in the ignition of sin. You covet. That's what happened in Genesis chapter 3. The serpent convinced, persuaded Eve to covet the fruit. You eat this stuff, and you're going to know some things. You're going to be like, God, oh, I want that. I don't have that, and I want that. And ever since then, it's been sin. Next chapter, what was Cain all upset about? Because he wanted what Abel had. Did he get what Abel had? Did, did the sin choice get him what he wanted? We always think it will, right? That's why you're drinking all that wine. That's why you're looking at the porn. That's why you're stealing from work. Whatever it is that you're doing that, another, you know, that other people aren't watching or seeing, that you're, you got an excuse for, whatever it is. Are, is it getting you where you want to go? I, I want that better life. I want that peace. I want the thing that... God would give me. Like, what did Cain want? He wanted God to like what he offered. And then look what happened. And coveting started it and it led right to murder. That's why it's so important to ask this question, what do you want? And some of us are all over the map. And if you're all over the map, well, welcome to the club. There's a lot of us who are just spread thin when it comes to what we want and we want things that are in contradiction to each other and that's why we're so miserable 
And that's why we're so unreliable. That's why we're not trustworthy as human beings, because we want this, but we want that, you know? We want to be faithful in our marriages, but we want to have that affair, too. That's why we're in trouble. That's why we need help. That's why we're not reliable. And it's, it's those desires. And what do you do if you find yourself with desires all over the map? Well, don't feel guilty or shame or try to hide, because that just leads to more sin. Don't do that. Just observe it. Just see it. Confess it. Talk to God about it. Be aware of it. Lots and lots of times, most times, we're not aware that our desires are in conflict. We're not aware. We're not, we don't know how to answer that question, what do you want? I know that I could press many of you, and you wouldn't have the slightest idea how to answer me if I said, what do you want? You might give me the right religious answer, but I can see through that. I already know that. Tell me the truth. I want to know the truth. Give me the true answer to this question, what do you want? Hmm. So envy's on the list. And then what's next? Look at that. Slander. Oral communication of false and malicious statements that damage the reputation of another. A false and malicious statement or report about someone a false tale. Or report maliciously uttered, tending to injure the reputation of another. The malicious utterance of defamatory reports. The dissemination of malicious tales or suggestions to the injury of another. Nothing kills loving community quicker than slander. And notice that it says we're to put away all slander, like all malice and all deceit. That sticks out a little to me. It makes me wonder if we have a tendency to put up with a little slander. A little malice, a little deceit, a little slander. What's the elixir? What's the cure for all this? How are we to be instead? Peter explains it there in verses 2 and 3. Don't make the mistake here of thinking that the word milk implies immaturity. And I think some people can do that. They can view themselves as seasoned Christians. And so when it comes to these verses, I'll just pass them by. But if you pass them by, you're no Christian at all. You're out in the cold. To be a Christian, to be a believer, is to want to be the real thing. And that's what's being talked about here. It refers to purity, not immaturity. Despite the fact that he's using infant and growing, that's part of the illustration. But the point that Peter is making is seek the real thing. Go for purity. Long for it. It's the one action step, really, in all of these ten verses. Everything flows from this. It's really not even something we do. All you do is want, just desire, just long for the pure spiritual milk. And that will bring you to Christ. And then you passively receive everything else he does. You are being built up into this spiritual house. He's doing that work. He's doing it. He's doing the work for you. Just like he did the work, all of it, for you on the cross to be saved. You didn't meet him halfway. You didn't, you know, pass some sort of test. That's the whole point. You failed the test. That's required. To come to Christ, you've got to have an F on the top of that paper. You know, here I am in need of you, Jesus. And you have to acknowledge it. And if you don't want to acknowledge it, then you're on your own. You have to acknowledge the fact that if it's to up to be, it's, it, if it's going to be, it's not up to me. If it's going to be, it's, it's up, to the, up to thee, Lord. It's up to you. I have to count on you. So the only thing here, the, the one response the Holy Spirit's looking for is this. Long for the pure spiritual milk. And don't mistake the word taste either. Some people say taste means put a little dip on the tip of your tongue. No, it means to consume. So if you're a Christian, you have consumed Christ's goodness. Amen? You know he is good, and that's why you long for his goodness. And I get it. There's that man in Scripture. What did he say? He said, I believe. Help me with my unbelief. Now, no way was that one guy once saying that. That's every Christian who ever lived, I believe, help me with my unbelief. Amen? I want you, Jesus. Help me want you. I long for the pure spiritual milk. 
Help me long for the pure spiritual milk of your word, of the gospel, of the scriptures of Jesus Christ. I need your help in this. The longing, the, the wanting, that's what we do if it is something we do. The rest of the passage, this famous passage describing the church gloriously, once again, it portrays our role as passive. We rest, we receive what Christ has blessed and achieved. Faith is his gift to us, not our gift to him. To want him, to long for him, is to come to him. As you come to him, verse 4, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. That's an amazing picture. Once again, it shows us that we're the products of our desires. Do we desire God? Then this is what happens. We have all these other desires that we think are in competition with our desire for God sometimes, and we think they're original desires. They likely are not. Mostly some algorithm, some advertisement put that desire in you. You've been trained. You've been indoctrinated. You've been led by your nose into wanting this, that, or the other thing. So many of the things that drive us are not of us. They, they were put into us. We accepted them, but we don't, we don't have to keep them. They can be replaced easily. There's, there's, there's some desires that you and I have that we could just forget about now and be done with, and we'd be just happier for it. And some of us have lived, well, I've got to do this. And maybe we got that from our parents or something that happened when we were a kid or whatever. You don't got to do this. There's all kinds of things you don't got to do, all kinds of things you don't got to be. Well, um, look how old I am now, and I haven't done this thing in my life. I haven't done that thing in my life. So what? Those things don't even really matter if you just look at it. Do you really want that stuff either? Are those things you really long for? How many times have I sat with somebody and there they are, now the consequences of the choices are all around them, they're, they're in over their heads, and they say to me, oh, I never wanted this. What did you want? And they'll describe it to me, and I'll be like, well, that sounds like what you had, and don't have any more. Hmm. When we long for the pure spiritual milk of the gospel, there's a change, there's a transformation, not just individually, but collectively. The church is, is, is a building we're going to see here described. We've already heard uh, Christ used that as well. He talked about the temple. You know, you destroy this temple, I'll raise it up in three days. They said, well, it took 46 years for us to build this temple. You're crazy. What are you talking about? He was talking about himself. He's the building. And, he, and that illustration continues here with the, with the reference to cornerstone. You know, for it says in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So this is a quotation from Isaiah 28, 16. It says the same thing, you know. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am the one who has laid as a foundation in Zion a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone of a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not be in haste. And that was offered to people who were in crisis, geopolitical crisis, and they needed hope. And often what the prophets do is they deliver hope, but they deliver next level hope. Mostly what we look for is something on the ground right now. Fix this local problem I have. And what do we have Scripture giving us? Here's the solution to all the problems, the root of that local problem and everything else. And what do we learn from this? That there's this one solution, no matter where we are in history, in time, no matter where we are on the globe, no matter what situation we're facing, the Bible, God through his word is going to offer us this one solution, the cornerstone, and his name is Jesus. It starts there. Your road back starts there. Your hope begins there. 
Your new day starts there with him, with Jesus. Do you want it? Do you long for it? The answers to these questions reveal what you believe. And what you believe determines your destiny, your eternity, and how the rest of your day will go today too. And that's where he goes. So the honor is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. So there's some quotes here from the Old Testament again. In verse 7, that's a quote from Psalm 118. Let's check this out. This is Psalm 118, verse 22 being quoted here. A handful of words later, you have the Bible verse that the people were shouting at Jesus when he entered Jerusalem triumphantly. Hosanna, they shouted. And you get that word, Hosanna, what they were referring to is this verse that's just a few verses after what's being quoted here in verse 7. Just listen to this. Psalm 118, 22 through 25. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. That's 22. Next verse. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Next verse. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. The next verse. Save us, we pray. O Lord, O Lord, we pray. Give us success. That's Hosanna. Save us. Hosanna! Hosanna! So even then, these people knew it's all connected. From the beginning, God has wanted to build us into a building, and there's so much to consider here. We don't want to be part of a building, and yet we do. We want to belong. You know, help me with my desires, Lord. Uh, help me want the pure spiritual milk. Uh, it says that we're to be like bricks. Like some of us, it's a tough illustration. Because, you know, bricks are in very close proximity to the other bricks. So if you're a brick and you want to be a standalone, on my own brick, well, that's not going to work. You're going to be cemented to the other bricks. That's the picture here. That's how life works. Amen. Oh, just the introverts. Amen. Amen. Oh, the introverts. <laughs> There's more introverts than there were people. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. The standalone brick is a piece of construction debris. And yet our culture is raising us up to be this. You can be an original. I, I was looking at different cars, you know, and they're marketed so that you can see yourself as unique. Along with the other 10,000 people that buy the same truck, you're unique. You're different than anybody else. You and these other 10,000 people, they're going to buy the same truck because they're going to buy into the same ad. You're unique. It makes me think of kids in high school. If you've got kids in high school and sometimes they're into a certain fashion, what's this? What are you doing? Why are all the holes in the pants? What, what is this? You know, those things, th th there's less fabric than there is skin right now. I, what is it? It's hanging there. What? I just, I'm an original. You know, it's just it's who I am. I'm expressing myself. You mean just like every other kid? You're an original just like every single one of them? Kind of all original together? That doesn't sound very original. Dad, you're dumb. You're dumb. Bricks cemented together with the brick, the cornerstone, the building. It's really what we want. We want to belong. We want to be connected despite the stories that some of our choices tell. We want this. This is the pure spiritual milk, the gospel. It's the gospel of coming back, being part, being a people. And that's what he talks about here. Uh, the verse 8 quotes Isaiah, too. It goes back to Isaiah, to this rich part of the prophecy given again to people who are in duress, saying, just you wait, a great Messiah is coming. So what we believe determines really everything that matters. And what we believe determines what and who we become. And that's what's talked about in this next verse. But you are, you 
you together, and of course that means if you're part of you together, you individually. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Look at that. It's one blessing after another. He is blessing enough. What he did for us on the cross is blessing enough. But he meant it when he said, seek first my kingdom and righteousness, and I'll give you all this other stuff. And it just keeps coming. Great stuff. Great positions and great blessings. Great ways that he meets the needs that are in us. Look at this. You are chosen. You may not feel very chosen. You may feel forgotten. You're chosen. You're royal. You may not look very royal right now, but on the inside, you're royal. And you can work on the other stuff later, right? You're chosen. You're royal. You're holy. Holy. He said it, not you. He makes it to be. He brings it about. He does this. We're built into Him. And we proclaim His excellencies, excellencies from this place of marvelous light. I mean, just one thing after the next. It makes me think of Christmas morning. I remember coming down Christmas morning. And, you know, Christmas morning might have been different for you, but I was just, it's all about the presents. You know, what did I get? You know, because I'm a kid and I want what I want and I want stuff. And so I'm coming down, and I'm happy, and I'm enjoying it, and there's all these presents, and it seems like there's just so many, they'll just never end. And, you know, my parents were kind of smart about how they did that, because, you know, you open one, and, oh, look, batteries. You know, <laughs> what are they for? I don't know. It's pretty exciting. You know, oh, a pair of socks. Oh, there's another pair of socks. Oh, another pair of socks. Kind of all wrapped individually, but kind of going through, just never going to end, never going to end. Then it finally does end, you know. And it's just great. Look at all my booty. You know, look at all I got. It's just so awesome. Well, with Christ, it never stops. It's present after present, gift after gift, blessing after blessing. Keep that focus on the blesser, and the blessings never, literally, never stop. They are eternal, they keep on coming. Life keeps on happening for you. It doesn't stop. The good things keep on being good and keep on being offered to you over and over and over again, continually. And that's what you see here, and it's overwhelming. What do we do with this? Well, the topper is next in, in God's mind. That last verse that we're looking at, verse 10. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. That's it. That's what I need. I need to be part of this, be God's person as part of God's people. And how can I be that? There's only one way, through his mercy and his mercy is a main ingredient in that pure spiritual milk that we're called by Scripture to long for, to long for it. Every church is filled with people who read these same words and marvel at them. We see our great imperfections, our, our great falling short all the time. And yet, we're caught up, caught up by the word, captured by its power. Yes, there's something in it that calls us, and we can't deny it. And at our church, we, we express it this way. You know, we in communion with Jesus Christ are a community of friends and families who love and trust them and passionately pursue the Christ-like character essential to fulfill our commission to change our lives for him. So in communion, we're longing together for the pure spiritual milk, longing for the Christ of the gospel found in the Bible. Amen? We're helping each other with that. We all know we're distracted. We all want 
other stuff, lesser stuff. We really, really do. And we, I can't wait till we can just start talking about it and being real. We're not there yet. We're half fake, right? There's some realness there, but still we pull back and do the fake thing, you know, especially on Sunday mornings. That's the most dangerous time if you're going to try to be authentic, right? But just break out. Don't judge anybody. Don't be judged yourself. Just know this is who we are. This is the struggle. We're going to help each other with this. We're going for the pure spiritual milk, the real thing. Amen. We're crying out for it. (laughs) Right? Yes, we are. In community, we're a people brought together by him and in him, built into a spiritual house. You're in the house. You're, you are the house. The house built in and out of Christ. And character, speaking of character, that means we do put away all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all slander. We put it away. And commission. We offer to all the mercy that we have received from the only source possible for such mercy, Christ himself. The four challenges of Goodwill 300 line up with this. And if we're talking about something very specific, that's what we are. When we refer to Goodwill 300 and our church, we we have to realize at the same time that we're talking about the entire church, wherever the church is, whoever the church is, whoever the church comprises of, the people of God are attempting to do the same thing that we are attempting to do here. And that is, to quote Peter from our text, offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Wouldn't that be great? Can't we do that? There it is. He's given us all we need to be able to give back to him something to offer that spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God. That means it's really, really, really good. You know? Not just, eh, it's, it's acceptable. No, really, really good. Great. So, the tithing challenge. Like, do you long for a self-disciplined life? The life of 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, for God didn't give us a spirit of timidity or fear, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline or a sound mind not about what you give. It's about who you are and whose you are. Tithing is a measure of it. It's not the only measure, just one measure. But it's a, it's a tangible measure. And so we've arranged the year. I'll show you the calendar again. I'm going to show it to you until you're sick of seeing it. But we arrange the year because we start with character, really, the New Year's resolution time, right? And that builds into the time of commission, Easter, the resurrection, Holy Week, what Christ did for us, the, the week of the gospel. We reach out with that. And then summers are oftentimes our time of of immersion into the Bible. Vacation Bible school, we call it after all, right? But it's not just that one week or two weeks. And then uh, the the fall into the holidays, that's our our time of, of serving, of giving to others. There's that great, great joy. And so the outreach challenge. And do you long for others to know him? Do you want to have people in your family know Christ? Do you want the people at work to know the Redeemer you know? The Bible challenge, do you long for the pure spiritual milk of Scripture to know what it means to get it in you as you get into it? The the serving challenge, do you long to bless others, to surprise them with the love of God? There's nothing better ever on earth. It's what we want. It's what we want. And, and there's the thing, you know, spread out over the year that you've seen, the slide you've seen many times already. Why do we do this? Because we, we, we long to. And it brings us back to this question. You know, what do you want? What do you long for? And for a lot of us, because we're tired, we're weary, we, we think we want to stop. We think we want an ongoing, endless vacation. We think we want, we think retirement is that sometimes, and then the big surprise is not that at all, you know? And I mean, I, I, I'm regularly faced with people who say, well, 
retirement is just not working for me. And it's definitely not working for my wife. I got it. Do you have anything I can do around here? You know? We think we want that, but what is it that we really want? So we were challenged in that, that circle of pastors when we were asked this question. And the next year, you know, they pick a pastor, the, the group over our group kind of picks somebody based on what's going on in their lives. And so when you know it, the next year it was me. And these are all people with major ministries, you know, they're impressive people to me. And we all struggle with that question. So now I have to follow up. I'm like, oh, how do I follow up with this? Because this is lingering with me. What do I want? I'm realizing that this question really is the holiness question. This is the, the question that precedes all this work. I mean, this, this question is behind everything. Like, why would I read my Bible? Well, why would I make these choices to have my life be more of a Christian life and less of a carnal, worldly life? Why would I do it? Well, what do I want? Do I want the world? Do I want the stuff on my bucket list? Really? Is it my bucket list? I think this is somebody else's bucket list. I don't even know if I want some of these things. What do I want? And then when you're tired, that's really pressed because you just want to get out. I want to run for my life. I want escape. So next year, there I am, acknowledging all this. And everyone's kind of looking at me like, glad I'm not him. Because it was, it was powerful. It was a powerful moment that year before when we were given that question, what do you want? So I said, well, I have another question. And it came up in me based on last year's question. So here's the question. What do you have? What do you have? And it came up for me because so often, you know, I see people blow up their lives or go to the ends of the earth looking for something, and then they realize, well, I just want what I had. I want, I want to be home. I guess I do want to stay married. I guess I do want to stay with the Lord and stay on track with this, this life he's called me to. What do you have? And that's a big question. And sometimes uh, that question can, can help us with that, that coveting trap. Like, wait a minute. Like, imagine if somebody had asked that question of Eve and Adam. Hold it before you chomp into that fruit. Just wait a minute. What do you have here? We have everything. We've got the garden, and, you know, every day, God himself walks with us in the cool of the garden. It just doesn't get any better than that. That's what you have? If that's what you have, then why do you want this other thing over here? Do you want it? What do you have? Look at all these terms used to describe us as Christians, as the people of God. They're amazing. There's just no room for being dissatisfied. Dissatisfaction has no footing here. What do you have? I know we often think about what we don't have. It drives the day shapes our personalities. It's the reason we're angry when we're angry. If there's a good enough reason to be angry ever, like we are so often. You're familiar with whatever you would use to fill up the sheet of paper that says, what, I, what do I not have? You know, what am I missing? What am I lacking? But what do you have? Let me pray. Lord, 
You've given us so much in yourself. And here we are uh, together in worship, uh, marveling at your word, uh, barely able to scratch the surface of the blessing of contemplating the meaning of Scripture together on this beautiful early autumn Sunday morning. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And Lord, you have plans for us. You, you want all these things. Everything we're reading about is your idea. It's your idea to redeem us. It's your idea to create us in the first place. It's your idea that we would seek you, and then you got to add it in there all the time, and then I'm going to give you some other stuff. The other stuff comes second. There's going to be a lot of it. Hang on. Seek me first. Seek my kingdom. Seek my righteousness. Delight in me, and I'll give you the desires of your heart. Long for the pure spiritual milk and you will grow up into salvation. You will grow up into becoming what I've called you to become, what I'll create in you, what I'll cause you to be. Thank you, Lord. Lord, if anyone here feels outside of you and wants to be inside, let them come in through confession saying, I need you. I need you, Jesus. I need what you did for me on the cross. I know that if I want you, I've got you. You won't turn me away. That's what you say in John. Uh, whoever comes to me, I will never turn away. You say that, so I'm coming to you. If there's anybody feeling that, praying that right here or online, Lord, bless them, bless them powerfully with a strong sense of assurance that you are the one driving this, that you're the one drawing them to yourself. Thank you, Lord. And Lord, for all the rest of us, help us with what we want. We do long for the pure spiritual milk of the gospel. Help us to long for the pure spiritual milk of the gospel. We do long for you. We long to be built up, to have you build in us, to have you give us the character to build ourselves into what you called us to be. Thank you, Lord. Bring glory to yourself through it all. In your name, Jesus, we pray, and all of God's people said, amen.